Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About Houses I've Taught. I'm Juana. Okay, today we're going to talk about consumer confidence mm. um, and, and the jobs numbers and how this affects the economy. We had a bunch of topics that we want, like a whole list of things. We'll probably do video, daily videos for maybe a week or two. Oh we have goodness. like a ton of topics we wanted to hit. Okay, I want a pay raise. I'm telling you that right now. You're getting a pay raise. <laughs> Uh, we have a new person on staff, Guido. He is now in charge of props. We fired Hernando because he did not bring the, us the eight ball okay. for the video that we did yesterday. So uh, welcome, Guido, to the team. Um, all right. Here's the article. U.S. consumer confidence climbs to highest since end of 2021. Juana, buying a house is when, when consumers are confident, what does that mean? Like, what is this index? What is this all about? Well, it's, you know, it's just that it's a sentiment, it's a feeling, it's the warm and fuzzies that people have. So people answer the, these surveys, right? Um, and they're asked, well, you know, how likely are you to uh, maybe make a major purchase? Um, how likely are you to switch jobs? Um, do you feel that there are plentiful jobs? You know, questions like that. Mm -hmm. And from questions like that, uh, they come up with this consumer confidence index. I remember it's an index, uh, which is a whole other discussion. Yeah. But um, the point is that this index has indicated that over the last three months, uh, consistently consumers have uh, stated that their confidence in the economy and their own and their family's economic outlook is looking up and they believe that it will continue to improve over time. Uh, here's our first quote for the article. U.S. consumer confidence increased in January to the highest level since the end of 2021 as Americans grew more upbeat about the economy and the job market amid more sanguine views about inflation. When people are confident, mm -hmm. when they're stable in their jobs and everything is going good, mm -hmm. they tend to feel better about doing things like buying houses, don't they? This is generally good news for the housing market, isn't it? In it's, general. It's good news for everybody all the way around because consumers don't just spend money on on um, new homes. They spend money on all, all sorts of goods and services. And so that is just generally good economic news. Okay. Um, here's another quote. The gauge of current conditions surged to the highest since March 2020. The measure of expectations rose to a six-month high. Consumers expected the inflation rate to average 5.2% in the next 12 months the lowest level since March 2020. So we have the expectation. So they ask them two questions. What, how do you think things are and what's your expectation for the future? Both of these are improving. Mm -hmm. They're both, you know, March 2020 was, there was a lot of uh, angst out there. What was happening in March 2020? Oh, uh, well, we were learning that while before you could not go into a bank with a mask, now you could not go into a bank without a mask. Right, right. Okay. So we were there was uncertainty about about this COVID thing and what was going to happen. Of course, March is when the 16th or 17th is when the state of California basically shut down mm -hmm. and said everyone go home and don't do anything. So obviously, and that's also when about the time the real estate market took off, which is really interesting. So I'm going to put well, up this. The, the real estate market first came to a halt and then it took off. For, it was like a one month where sales dropped mm -hmm. and it was like May or June. And and then literally the next month it took off and home prices like shot up. Mm -hmm. That's when, I think it was if you look at July of 2020, magically had this massive spike. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put up this chart. Uh, this is uh, two separate charts. The first, the top chart is the consumer confidence index. As you look at that chart is 114.8. Remember this is an index. This index level, the way they do it, is 100 is at the long-term average. Mm -hmm. so, and then they it bounces up around 100. Um, you could see that 2020 until 2021, it was kind of down. And then it popped up, and it's been pretty positive. Uh, but you could see, the if you just look at the last few months here, you can see the last four months, how this thing, it, it's really taken off. Looks pretty good. Um, and then below that is the present situation index. Uh, and that's... These, you can just kind of look at these charts while we talk about it. Um, another thing, though, I want to talk about is if people believe that not only is their job secure, but that is a very low likelihood that they will be let go of their job, or even if they're let go of their job, there's other jobs. Because mm -hmm. we have jobs numbers we're going to hit in a bit. How does that affect 
this overall sense of all consumption, including making investments in real estate? Well, so if people are confident in their financial prospects, then people are going to make investments in themselves, in, in their home. Uh, and as far as real estate is concerned, it makes it more likely that people will move forward with uh, the purchase of a new home. What I think is interesting is that even though people are complaining about the expensive, most expensive ever time to buy home, that's included in this co consumer confidence. It is. And what's interesting to me is that um, this is just kind of such a, a tale of two stories, right? Because you've got consumer confidence is up and you've got, um, you know, good job numbers, good, um, un good unemployment numbers, good inflation numbers. So those are all good things. And then the flip side of that is uh, you've got debt rising, you've got savings plummeting. So there's just this whole thing going on that I think is... Um, is what's giving a lot of people pause. So you've got the people who are, you know, the cup is half full and half empty. So the half empty people are pointing to all the things that are are clearly of a, a, a concern, right? Which I'm not discounting. And then you've got the people that the cup is half full that, that are looking at all these positive things. And as usual, the truth is probably somewhere in between, not always in the middle, but somewhere in between. I have a theory about the savings plummeting mm -hmm. and I don't think it's actually plummeting I think okay. it's actually skyrocketing okay tell me about this okay that I don't have a chart for this I'll, I'll find one we we'll probably do a video on this the level of savings mm -hmm. that appears people were pulling money out of savings and spending it is almost exactly correlated with the rise of money flowing into uh, money markets yes I believe People, because savings is being, is checkable deposits is what they, it's mm -hmm. savings checkable deposits. Um, when you pull your money out of your bank account and put it in E-Trade or Schwab or some other thing, because you want to stick it in a 5% money market, mm -hmm. that money does not count as savings. It goes in as, it goes in as money markets in, um, there's about $7 trillion mm -hmm. in money markets. So what I believe is that you have a lot of people who are not saving the money because it's not cost effective to have money in a savings account to put it in some other thing. I don't, I don't know if I'm right on this. I think, you know, I know personally I wouldn't want to have half a million dollars. Like if we were getting ready to buy a house, we had 500000 cash. I wouldn't have it in a savings account. I'd go stick it in a money market, get 4 or 5%, mm -hmm. and then two months, three months, four months, whenever it takes to find the house – because the, the money's liquid. You just say, hey, I'm, I'll transfer. It takes a day or two, three days maybe. And then boom, it's in your, back in your checking account. And you and it's appreciated a little bit, right? So that's my theory on that. I think it's a good theory. Um, it doesn't quite address the consumer debt portion. And I think that is something that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, okay. But I, I think the consumer debt portion needs to be looked at from a cultural perspective. I'm going to talk about that after this quote. Okay. Because I, I actually know what's going on with oh, consumer debt. I like it. Let's I have the that. knowledge. The crystal ball that Hernando <laughs> did not bring, Guido did not bring. His first day on the job, the, we need the crystal ball. Guido's fired. Guido, <laughs> you're fired. If you're watching this, you're fired. Don't come to work tomorrow. Can't believe it. Day one, he doesn't bring the, the eight, magic eight ball that we can use. Okay, here's the quote. January's increase in consumer confidence likely reflected slower inflation, anticipation of lower interest rates ahead, and generally favorable employment conditions as companies continue to hoard labor. They're hoarding labor. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, Dana Pretty Pierce, the chief of concept of the conference board, sent a statement. Um, first things first. Okay. So what, uh, first thing, what does hoarding labor mean? It's when your workers come to work. Yeah. You say, hey, guys, come to work. We're going to have like a Saturday work thing and they come in and you lock up the doors. You guys, you guys aren't leaving. We're hurting you. You can't go anywhere else. You can't leave for another thing. Basically, they're, they're um, I think that's kidnapping. It's kidnapping. Yeah. But they get paid extra. <laughs> no. Um, okay. Silicon Valley companies went through this for a while. Okay. So a lot of these tech layoffs mm -hmm. were Silicon Valley companies with so much cash they were literally hiring people to keep them from going to competitors and to keep them from starting up comp competing companies. Mm -hmm. So 
a guy would show up and say, hey, this is very common. And I'll give you an example. We used to be partners in a tech startup. And literally another company came in one day and said, hey, you're in our space. We want to meet you and talk about a joint venture. And literally they walked in and said, we're thinking about just hiring everybody to our company. Like you'll shut down your company and no one will get equity and you'll all just come over and work for us. And we were like, uh, no, we're like owners of the company. If we did that, we would lose our investment because you're not going to pay us for the equity of our value of the company. You're just going to steal all the employees. It's just a, you're stealing employees. So that's what happens sometimes. So um, a lot of these tech layoffs are just companies shedding those people because they realize that uh, they don't need to do that anymore, I think. Maybe they don't need to do that, or maybe they simply want to be um, a little leaner and meaner and be rewarded by Wall Street for it. That's possible. Okay, here's the thing. There's, the reason consumer debt is so high mm -hmm. has nothing to do with things are so bad. People are struggling. They can't make their mortgage payment. The money, amount of money spent on mortgage payments mm -hmm. relative to total disposable income is 4%. You, you will do a video on this. 4% of all earnings are used to make mortgage payments. Right. So before you tell us that you're spending a greater percentage than that, remember this, what's calculated in this is everybody's earnings versus all the mortgage payments out there. And this is considering that 42% of all homes are owned free and clear. And this is considering people at all economic levels. So that's how they come up with this number. Yeah, this is absolutely the case. Um, the number one reason why consumer debt is so high is because of consumer confidence. Consumers are confident they can pay this debt. They're like, look, I'm going to go, let's go buy a Tesla. I know it's 70,000 bucks with full self-driving to get a brand new Model Y. But look, we both have jobs. Everything's great. We, we have regular income. Let's take on this debt. Let's go out and buy new furniture, yada, yada. We can pay this off because we have, you know, the means to do it. And we feel good about the future. And we'll talk about the jobs report, uh, which is basically uh, going to corroborate that. Because when I tell you the... Um, vacant number of jobs, the jobs that have not been filled, you will be blown away. The idea that there could be a recession and everyone would lose their jobs and have nowhere to work is absolutely false. Okay. Okay. So um, I'd like to also discuss for a moment the consumer debt. Um, I okay. think the consumer debt is a little bit of what you said, but I think it's also a separate part of the picture, which is that the part of the reason why the consumer debt is so high is because the interest rates on consumer debt is exorbitant right now. So that is uh, exacerbating maybe a different and uh, lower amount of actual consumer debt. So it's because of the higher interest rates. So I think that's part of what's going on. Meaning if your credit card is at 33% and there are credit cards out there at 33%, then that's crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, you're making your minimum payment. Well, guess what? Every month you actually go further into debt. So that's part of the reason why the consumer debt is so high is because of that. Uh, I think people are struggling to keep keep up with those payments and that's what's causing part of that consumer debt to be so high. Now, a lot of that will be redressed. Um, you know, as rates come down, those interest rates for credit cards will also come down and then uh, consumers will be at a break even point with their credit cards and then be able to start paying them off. Um, I think the consumers that are having the most difficulty are the ones that are tenants because if you are a homeowner, uh, homeowners on occasion have been known to use their home as a piggy bank to clear their consumer debt. That means that they will take out a home equity line of credit mm -hmm. to pay off their consumer debt, which is at a much higher interest rate. So maybe you've got a 10% uh, home equity line of credit and you're paying off your 33% credit card hey, that makes a lot of sense. So now you can actually make some headway for that debt. So the people who cannot do that are tenants. So those are the people that are most burdened by that consumer debt. Then they need to buy a house <laughs> because if their tenants having the hardest time, these people go home or homeowners and then they can live the dream. Right. So um, I think that's who we're talking about. So for the people who say, well, um, you know, people can't make their mortgage payments because of their consumer debt, that kind of debunks that theory because I've just stated that those people t 
tend to be the tenants, not the homeowners. Uh, here's another quote. The third straight monthly increase in confidence suggests at least some of the momentum in household spending mm -hmm. late last year will endure. Resilient demand accompanied by a healthy job market, improved inflation expect expectations has the potential of keeping the economy on its expansion path. Absolutely, you could not have said these words in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, we've, we, we're on year five of the next year will be the housing crash. <laughs> we've had five years of housing crashes that didn't happen. And everything, the trajectory is that the economy is doing just totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, here's another quote. Views of the job market improved from December. The share of consumers who said jobs were currently plentiful increased to a third month of the highest since April. The difference between those say, saying jobs are plentiful versus hard to get a metric closely followed by economists to gauge labor market stray, strength also improved. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? What people believe about jobs? Because they tend to be self-fulfilling prophecies. <laughs> Okay. So look, a lot of what people believe, whether it's about jobs or about the economy or whatever it is, they tend to be self-fulfilling prophecies. Because if you believe that the economy is doing poorly, then you won't go out and spend and then the economy will do poorly because there's less commerce going on. If you believe that, um, that unemployment will go up, then you are less likely to, um, to maybe change jobs or uh, take or engage in other economic activities which down the line it trickles down to somebody losing their job. So maybe you're less likely to go on vacation or go out to dinner or have a new roof put on or whatever. And of course that means that the people in those industries are less likely to have work and they will lose their jobs and that's how that trickles down. It doesn't mean that you will lose your job, it just means that your lack of economic activity may result in, in um, a, a business shrinking its workforce. Uh, here's a headline from an article. Because the January job numbers just came out, U.S. job openings rise to three-month high, mm -hmm. but fewer workers quit. There's three things in here. We'll start with the first one. Mm -hmm. um, three-month high, that means it's higher than the last two months. And the last two months were pretty high. Right. Okay. Tell, fewer workers quitting. Remember we had this job churn because people... During inflation, people were leaving mm -hmm. because they were going to other companies because other companies were having to pay more money mm -hmm. for wages. So we had 5.5% wage inflation in the year, which like was the highest since the 80s or something. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It was last year's wage inflation was really high. Right. Why is that good that fewer workers are tr moving around? So that's good for a lot of reasons. So to start with, that means that companies are not having to compete for workers and pay more money which means that there's not more money being infused into the, um, into the system, so you don't have um, more money chasing fewer goods. So that's a good thing. Uh, stability is good all the way around. It's good for the stock market, it's good for the housing market, it's good for, for everybody. Everybody likes predictability and stability, so that's really good. And then last but not least, uh, stability in people's lives. That's a good thing. Uh, that's part of that consumer confidence that we were just talking about. People not going out and trying to job hop, being stable, being content, that's a good thing because, again, stability is what markets like and what all, all of us like. I'm going to put the title of the headline back up. <laughs> there's somewhere out there, there's a crash bro right now doing a video <laughs> where he's only taking the top line of this that says U.S. job openings rise to three. <laughs> and he's saying, look, guys, there's only three jobs created and it rose to three. So there's no jobs and housing crash. I mean, Siri, and he's probably, yeah, I thought that was funny. When I read the thing and I saw it, I was like, rose to three. Okay, here's the other thing, the last thing about jobs. This is really the big one. To all the people who have said, but Todd, as soon as the recession comes, the job losses, the foreclosures, they all happen within days, literally days, immediately they happen. Vacancies rebounded to 9 million last month, above estimates. Normal number of quits dropped the lowest level in three years. Why don't we have 9 million jobs mm -hmm. where people at companies are saying, we need people in all these things. Like we need 20 employees in these different areas, maybe some tech, maybe some non-technical, marketing, sales, support, whatever, right? So here's the thing about that. Okay. And um, you, you're gonna like this part. Uh -huh. <laughs> This is 9 million jobs that are being advertised. That does not mean that there are only 9 million jobs available. There is a shadow inventory of jobs 
I knew, shadow I knew inventory, you like guys. That. The shadow inventory of jobs is going to crash. That wait, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so there. Okay. So what I mean by shadow inventory of jobs. So for example, um, you know, I am closely um, in touch with a company that currently has openings for three positions, okay. and they are similar positions. Okay. But only one position is being advertised. Ah, why is that? Because the, posi- the other two positions are the same thing. So it makes no sense to post the same job three times. Why would we pay you know, um, the different job boards to post the, the same job three times? That makes no okay. sense. So we post the job once, but we have three jobs available. We- so this is what I mean by shadow inventory of jobs. There are 9 million jobs advertised, but there are a lot more than that. A lot more than that available just like this employer is only advertising one position when there are actually three positions available other employers do the same thing when they have similar positions available they will only advertise one and then the hiring manager will then go ahead and review the applicants and go okay well this might fit you this might fit you and this might fit you go go forth and, and find yourself a person yeah okay so and if a small company like this that only has a, you know, a very few employees is, is doing this, now imagine a much bigger employer that maybe employs 10,000 people and maybe they have 100 jobs posted out there. What is the true number of jobs that they're actually seeking to fill? And my, you know, using this particular scenario, it stands to reason that the true numbers that, that of jobs that, that they're uh, seeking to fill is far greater. You know, is it three times as much? I don't know. Uh, but we can certainly extrapolate from this example that it would be more than 100 jobs. So when you're seeing 9 million jobs available, please understand that there is a shadow inventory of jobs. And is that truly 30 million jobs? I don't know. But I do know that it's a whole lot more than 9 million jobs. And then lastly, these 9 million jobs are at all levels of employment. Um, They're not just the bottom of whatever you're you're looking at. They're not just service industry or they're not just construction or administrative or whatever. They are throughout the economy. They have a variety of, of pay ranges. And this is a sign of a very healthy job market. Uh, this is a sign of an economy that is expanding, um, and this is a sign of other industries that would benefit from people having good jobs, from people having job stability, from people being able to find new jobs if uh, their position is no longer um, available for them. So those are all good things for the economy. and for our society in general. The idea that any slowdown in the economy or job losses, they, they're like they would not be able to find a job and they would instantly be foreclosed mm-hmm. is the most ridiculous thing ever. If anything, with 42% of all homes being owned free and clear, mm-hmm. with 80 plus percent of the existing other, the mortgages having less than 5% mortgages, there's almost no chance people are going to want, they're going to, they're going to do everything they can to stay in the house. Everyone does not live paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> and also you have to miss payments for years mm-hmm. before banks will foreclose. Right. If they're, We've had two recessions in the last four years. We had the 2020 recession, the COVID lockdown one. And then we had the 2022 recession. It was very, very mild. and But it was two quarters of negative growth, minus 0.4%, minus 0.1%. The government said, no, no, it's not a recession. We had, we grain, we added jobs to start. So yeah, the economy shrank a little, but it was just a, it was a shadow thing after COVID lockdown, but it wasn't really a recession. Right. And it was primarily because of supply chain chain issues. It was supply chain issues and we're waving it off. We're not going to call it. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was tech, it was a technical recession and housing market exploded. So the idea that all these bad things are going to happen, the bottom line is this, this does, obviously anything can happen in a given specific market in the country. We know there's some markets where rents are going up. Mm-hmm. We know like um, in uh, New York City mm-hmm. and places like that. We know there's some areas where rents are dropping, mm-hmm. like in parts of Florida, rents are dropping, right? Aggr- in aggregate, rents are going up at 2% a year, which is a little lower than the long-term average. Mm-hmm. But remember, we just had 15% 
we just had a year of 50% rate rent increases, mm -hmm. right? So 2% is a lot less than 15%. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you look at this in totality, there's not a lot to suggest some broad economic thing will cause some odd thing to happen that's unpredictable. Right. So um, we know that there's a lot going on in the world and yeah. we know that that impacts how people feel, it impacts um, the actions of our um, governments, and all of those have an impact on our economy. However, we can't consider all that. So what we're considering is the hard numbers that are provided uh, regarding g the um, general economic health, and that's what our discussion is about. Okay, if you have a really good idea for a video, please let us know. If you live in Vegas and you want to sell your house but remain as a tenant, mm -hmm. we have investors that would like to swoop in, purchase the house, and not have to have like put it on the market for rent. You can just stay there for six months, a year, two years, whatever, and for market sell it for market value, rent for market value. It's right. not a scam. We're just saying if you if you need to sell because you need the money but you want you still want to stay in the house, we can make that happen. Right. I'll put our information in the description. You can reach out to us. This is only in Las Vegas, but right. we may be able to help find somebody in other markets. We actually had somebody said, I'm in Dallas and I need to do this. So Okay. Well, yeah. we'll see what we can do for you, Dallas. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, do reach out to us. Uh, like we said, we're not, uh, our investors are not looking to give you a low ball offer. This is not, you know, 70 cents on the dollar. This is market value. Um, and this could be good for you. So we, would love to chat with you. Uh, please. Also, leave. we're looking for a new props person. Oh my um, so you can apply at the same email address below. Okay, absolutely. And if you happen to uh, be the props person for us, uh, please bring a magic eight ball and a crystal ball to your job interview. Uh, yeah. Please remember to like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share the video, leave us your real estate related comments. Um, Please don't put your personal information regarding uh, your job application uh, or your um, or any information about the crystal ball and um, eight ball unless you're sending sending us those props. Right. Uh, we hope you had a good time. We clearly had a great time chatting with you. We'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.